right, Hacky Reitman here, and today we're here, we're talking with Ron Kaufman. Ron, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me, Hacky. Well, you are a very controversial character, you know? <laughs> in, in some circles, sure. You've had a remarkable history, so why don't we start with you telling me about your history. Tell our listeners. All right, you got it. Uh, well... Okay, so when I was a little boy, I was diagnosed with severe autism. Now, when I say severe, just so we're clear, I'm talking about I had no language, no eye contact, uh, a tested IQ of less than 30. Uh, I would spend hours and hours every day rocking back and forth and flapping hands in front of my face. Uh, one of the things I would also do for many hours a day is I would take uh, kitchen plates and I would spin them on their edge on the floor over and over again and flap my hands over them. And I for hours and you couldn't distract me from this. And my parents were told, like I said, that I had a severe autism and that this was not, not just that it was severe in the moment. And this is important because uh, the, it's not just the diagnosis that's the issue, it's the prognosis. And the prognosis that my parents got were, was that this is a permanent lifelong condition. This was how I was gonna be for the rest of my days on earth. And they, they did something really amazing in the face of that, which was they developed their own home-based, very much child-centered program where they were, and they called it the Sunrise Program, but they spelled it S-O-N because I was their son. And they, they worked with me for about three and a half years. And at the end of that period, as you can guess, uh, I went on to recover completely, you know, without any trace of my former condition. You know, grew up in a regular school with regular friends, graduated from the Ivy League's Brown University with a degree in biomedical ethics, which was never supposed to be in the cards for me. And now it's really amazing because now with our whole team of about 80 other people at the Autism Treatment Center of America in, in Massachusetts, I'm able to sort of work with all these people and then work with parents and families from over 100 different countries to help them help their children in the same way that my parents helped me. So it's, it's really an honor. And uh, it's also been kind of a crazy just experience because after my recovery, uh, my father wrote this book called Sunrise, The Miracle Continues. It became a bestseller. It was then made into an NBC television movie. So then people started coming to us for help. And in 1983, my parents founded uh, a nonprofit organization uh, the, now known as the Autism Treatment Center of America. So it's a nonprofit organization, uh, really nicely nestled in kind of the Berkshire Mountains in the Berkshires in Massachusetts. And that's where I was telling you about, where people and parents and educators come from all over to learn the techniques of the Sunrise Program. Why do you think it is that you've become controversial from your point of view? You know, it, it's a that's a really good question. I think that there are two reasons, if I could say, if we could say. So I think the first reason is simply because there is still a bit of a battle going on. And when I say battle, I'm not battling, but I think there is a little bit of a controversy going on in the autism community still around the issue of recovery itself. Can a child or adult from autism ever not have autism at some point? Um, and I look. I'm not one of these people that thinks recovery is the only good outcome. We've worked with a lot of other kids after me who have completely recovered just like me, but we've also worked with a lot of kids after me who have made extraordinary progress and changes and have absolutely not recovered. I wouldn't call them recovered at all. So I think it varies, and I think all different kinds of outcomes can be a victory and can be really wonderful for these kids. I'm a total fan of neurodiversity. I'm not trying to stamp out autism, um, but the thing I do feel is that when we start having a fight over recovery and start going into this, sort of going down this road of autism must be a permanent lifelong condition, we kind of end up cutting our kids off at the knees because we decide for a three-year-old or a five-year-old or a seven-year-old what the next 50 years of that person's life are going to be like and what they're never going to be able to supposedly do or accomplish. So we feel like the only ethical stance that we can take since we've worked with kids who've recovered and we've worked with kids who haven't and we have no way of knowing in advance, the only ethical stance that we think is, makes sense to take is to begin with the premise with each child that each and every child is capable of full recovery. And so at least we're, we're not the ones holding them back. We're starting from they can do anything and then some of those kids go all the way, some of them make extraordinary changes, but are still really different in wonderful and exciting ways. And I really feel like 
there's room for all of us. It doesn't mean that someone has to recover or not recover. But I do think that's a big, one big reason for the controversy. So people have said to me, always people who've never met me, by the way, you know, Ron must never have recovered. But then when they meet me, they, they sort of have a different stance on that. And, uh, and like I said, there have been many people that have recovered after me. So it's not like I'm the one person in the world who's done this. Uh, the other thing, let me just say, Hacky, I think there is a second reason why I might in some circles, I guess, be considered controversial. And it's not for me in particular. But I do think there is something controversial about the Sunrise program itself. I think less and less with each passing year as it goes into more countries and it becomes more mainstream. But I do think there's still a controversy because the fundamental idea of the Sunrise program is that, number one, autism is a social relational disorder, not a behavioral disorder. So rather than trying to change behaviors, we focus on creating a relationship because these kids have difficulty connecting and creating relationships with other people. Now, the controversial part of that is that one of the very first techniques we do in the Sunrise program is called joining. And what that means is that rather than trying to force these kids to conform to a world they don't understand, we join them in their world first. So for instance, when I used to spin plates like that, my mom was told, you've got to stop him, you've got to take the plate away, you've got to redirect him. And even also back then they were using aversives, so they were also teaching punishment in that. And you know what my mom did? Every time she saw me spinning a plate, she'd get a plate of her own, she'd sit down next to me, and she would spin plates with me. And she was told, I still get told this sometimes, this is the worst thing you can do. It's going to make the child do it more. But in real life, in the, the world where we've actually done this with thousands and thousands of kids over 30 years, what we actually find is the more we join, the more these kids look at us, become interested in us, start to let us into their world, start to engage in reciprocal play with us. And that opens the door to all the other learning and all the other things that we want to teach them that may be really challenging for them later on. Well, you know, I was lucky enough to be uh, hanging out with you and Stephen Shore and Temple Grandin out there in Tucson. With I had my Asper Tools off this table, and we all had our tables, and it was it was kind of surrealistic to me uh, being uh, the newcomer and not really being a member of the club because, after all, you, Temple Grandin, and Stephen Shore like my daughter Rebecca, who has her discrete math degree from Georgia Tech, are autistic. And I don't know what I would have been labeled having been expelled in the first grade in the 10th grade, but probably wouldn't be autistic. <laughs> I had an authority problem, Ron. Um, but I remember when I watched you speak that day, the, while it was all so wonderful, the thing that really sticks with me and again, this could be because I produce movies and documentaries and stuff too, was that little vignette you put on with your assistant. That resonated with me, and it makes me want to collaborate with you on a bunch of similar vignettes where you want to repeat for our audience that particular one because it was great. It was great. Sure. No, I'm so glad that resonated with you because I often find that when I'm talking to parents, that's the moment where the light bulb goes on. Uh, so yeah, I'd be happy to explain that. So this is, uh, this, uh, it's, an, it's an analogy and it explains why joining these children in the very behaviors that everyone else is trying to stop, why is that so powerful? Why does that work so well? Why does that yield such incredible results? So let's talk about that. So let's imagine that you've had a really tough week, you're exhausted, uh, you just, oh, you're just completely wiped out. You're stressed out. You're really overloaded, and you just need to decompress. You just need a moment to yourself. But luckily, someone agrees, maybe your spouse or a friend, to totally take care of the kids for the day. They're going to take care of everything at the house. You have the day to yourself. You can go off and do whatever you need to do to relax. So you go to a, a nice park. It's a beautiful day. There's a gentle breeze. The sun's out. And you get your favorite book by your favorite author because that's what you, you love to read, and you have a favorite author you especially love to read. So you take this book, you start reading, and time goes on, and oh, as you start reading, you finally start to relax a bit. You stop thinking about all the other stuff. You start, stop feeling overwhelmed by everything. You're just getting 
and into what you're doing. You're reading your book, you're enjoying yourself. And then some guy comes over to you, you know, I don't know, maybe some loud, bald guy or something comes up to you and he's like, hey, what's up, man? How you doing? Hey, listen, here, hold, look at me for a sec. Here, listen, I know you're like busy reading, reading, but it, you know, it looks kind of antisocial. You're like by yourself all day. I'll tell you what, let's put the book down. We'll go see a movie. There's a movie playing just a few blocks away. My treat. Movies are great. I, I, I picked out a really good one for us. So let's put the book away. Let's go see a movie. And. You turn to me and you're like, oh, you're a little overwhelmed by even just me getting in your face. And you're, you're saying, sir, listen, thank you. I, I appreciate the offer. I just, I've had a really tough week. I, I don't even really like movies. I just want to read this book, okay? I'm just really into this book. So thanks, but no thanks. And I'm wondering why you're not listening to me. Oh, you know what? Maybe I just didn't get your attention enough. So I step in front of you. I push the book aside. I go, hi. How you doing? Look at me right here, right here. Okay, come on, stand up. We're going to go to the movies. Come on, let's go. Let's do it. And now you're, you're getting a little peeved with me. So you stand up and you're like, sir, seriously, I need you to back off right now. You're, you're totally in my face. I just explained to you, I do not want to go to the movies with you. I just want to read my book, okay? And then it dawns on me. I'm, I'm so embarrassed. I guess I should have seen this before. You know what the problem is? The problem is your book. I mean, it's very distracting. You're kind of obsessed with it. You're like looking at it. But you know what? If I can get that book out of your hands, then I know you're going to pay attention to me and go to the movies with me. So I walk up to you and I grab the book away. You jump up to try and stop me. I go, I jump up, up, up. You will get the book back after we go see a movie. Now, this probably sounds familiar to a lot of your viewers because a lot of, this is how a lot of us deal with our kids. And we're, we, we're coming from the best place. We're trying to help our kids. We're not trying to make our lives, their, their, our kids' lives miserable. But let's, let's really look at this through the eyes of our, of our kids. What is this experience like for our kids who basically have this interaction with adults every single day? So let's talk about this for a second. Now, there's two issues that are, that are especially important and pertinent here. Now, autism, of course, is a, is a myriad of many different challenges, but I just want to highlight two for a second. One is our children are, the, the part of their brain that organizes and processes sensory information is not functioning the way ours do. So this is also often called a sensory processing disorder or a sensory integration disorder. And what happens is, is that means all the sights and all the sounds and even all the things that are touching your child's skin are coming in in this very helter-skelter way, in a very overwhelming way, much more intense than for us. You know, for us, if, if you're talking to someone, there's a little background noise, no biggie. You just tune it out. Our, our brains are actually really good at that. But for most of our kids, that background noise and a million other background noises and the clothes against their skin and the smells in the air and all the lights in the room, that's all coming in at the same loud volume. So when you tell your child, pay attention, which of the 25 things are they supposed to pay attention to? So that's one issue going on. But the second issue, though, is that partly because of the first issue, our children's brains have difficulty recognizing patterns in the same way that we do. So things that seem really uh, understandable to us and normal seem very random and uh, haphazard to our children. You know, I go up to you, I say, hi, how you doing? My name's Ron. You know, that means you shake my hand. But for many of our kids, I'm just a guy with his hand out because that's another pattern that they haven't maybe yet recognized. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is because given these two challenges, our children could, I mean, this is very overwhelming to any human being. When a, when a regular adult has something like this, people have nervous breakdowns. I mean, this is a big deal. But our children are so brilliant and so clever and so capable and so aware, actually, of their own needs that they have actually come up with the perfect coping and self-regulation sort of solution for this. And it is what many people call the stim. Now, we have a different word for it, but just to use that word for the moment, this repetitive behavior that our children do, that everyone's trying to stop. So this is a fascinating development here because what our kids do is, let's say a child is stacking blocks. So actually, when a child stacks blocks over and over again in a repetitive way, now to us, it looks like, why are they doing that? But to our children they can finally start to focus intensely enough on this that they can begin to tune out the sensory bombardment that comes in. Unfortunately, one of those things they're tuning out is us, but this is the best they can do to take care of themselves. And 
by stacking it in a very repetitive way that they can control, they actually can create this little island of predictability in a sea of unpredictability. So they actually create exactly the right solution for themselves. And you know what? I, we watch kids, and there's been an increasing number of studies on this. As kids do these stims, they start to relax. They start to feel better. They start to self-regulate. But as soon as they feel better, what do we do? Put that down. Put that down. Quiet hands. No, come over here. No, look at me. Right? We come in like an airplane to, to break this up. Right? We're giving them this message over and over again. This message is stop doing what you want. Do what I want. Stop doing what you want. Do what I want. And then we say, why don't these kids want to be part of our world? <laughs> but look at what our world looks like to them. And again, you know, I've watched so many parents who love, love their kids do this. It's whenever I see a parent do it, I, I can watch them. They're always coming from love. They're, they're trying to help their child. That's the only thing they're trying to do. They don't understand maybe what this looks like from their child's point of view. From their point of view, they're trying to help. They're trying to love their child. But their child doesn't see it that way. That's not the child's experience. So let me say one more thing about this. Now imagine, let's just return to the analogy for a second. So now you're reading your book, you're enjoying your book, and I come by again. I'm a different guy now. I got plenty of hair. I'm not so loud. It's great. And I'm a different guy, and I, I come by with my own book, right? I don't even say anything to you. I come by with my own book. I sit down next to you. I open my book. I start reading it. So you're reading. I'm reading. Eventually, you know, you, you see a guy reading next to you. You glance over. Oh, my gosh. You, oh, my God. You cannot believe what you see here. I mean, this is, this is crazy. I don't know what the odds are, but this is just insane because this guy sitting next to you, he's not just reading. He is reading the same book that you're reading, and this is your favorite book, and he's reading it. I mean, what are the odds? This is, this is crazy. So, look, you try to ignore him, but after a while, you've you got to say something. So, eventually, you tap me on the shoulder, and you're like, oh, hey, sir, I'm so sorry to bother you. I just noticed you're reading the same book as, as me, and, and this is like my favorite book. And I'm like, it's your favorite book? Shut up. It is my favorite book. And you're like, oh, my God, really? did you read this author's last book? And I'm like, yeah, could you believe that ending? And you're like, no, I couldn't believe it. And we have this whole conversation about the book and how much we like the whole trilogy and the whole thing. And then it's time for me to leave, so I leave. But the next, say, four Saturdays in a row, I come back again with my book. We're reading together. We're talking together. We build, a, a, we build this relationship around a common interest. And build a sense of trust and connection and community. And then, maybe after four weeks of this, it's about time for me to leave. And I go, oh, hey, just wanted to let you know, next weekend, the movie version of this book is coming out. So if you want, you know, instead of meeting here next Saturday, we can meet at the movie theater, maybe see that. What do you think? So now, if you see that the end, the end place where I went was actually the same in both analogies. But the way that I got there was diametrically opposed. It was totally different. In one, one instance, I'm stamping out what you love and trying to drag you in my direction. In the other, I'm bonding with you around what you love and then connecting what you love to the thing that I want to invite you to. This is the cornerstone of the entire Sunrise program. This is why it works in the way that it works. It's, and it's not even just that we get really amazing progress with a lot of these kids. It's the type of progress we get. It's a very socially based progress and it comes from the child actually wanting to participate with us versus doing what they're told and learning compliance, which is what a lot of more traditional therapies tend to focus on. Let me ask you this, Ron. My feeling is, is that adults have been unintentionally discriminated against because we're always talking about the child, the child, the child. Well, the children grow into adults. My daughter's 33 years old with Asperger's. Um, tell us about your feelings about the child versus the autistic adult. You know, Hacky, I'm really glad you brought that up because uh, I feel like that doesn't really get talked about enough. You're absolutely right. Uh, it, there is an, it's an intense focus on children, often at the expense of either teenagers or adults, absolutely. and. I think this goes to something a little deeper than just people pay more attention to the kids. I think it's deeper than that. I think it has a lot to do with how autism is viewed by a lot of professionals and then even a lot of families and people in the autism community, which is it gets viewed as 
there's this little window early in life where you can really maybe make a difference. You catch it early enough, you, you, you zero in on it early enough, wow, maybe you could really make a difference for some of these kids, right? But, you know, once a child's seven or 12 or 15 or certainly 33, the brain's sort of like, like cement that's hardened into concrete. It's sort of formed its bonds and the person sort of is what they are. And the thing about this, I think this is a real mistake we make because just like a neurotypical person who is 33 or 23 or 53, a person on the spectrum's brain is plastic and changeable throughout their whole life. A person with autism or Asperger's syndrome is capable of all sorts of growth and change and learning new things and becoming interested in new things and connecting with people in new ways. This is a big reason why we, do we work with some little kids? Sure. But we also work with teenagers. We also work with people in their 20s and 30s and 40s because what we've seen is it's never too late. There's not some magic age at which the brain stops changing and the person cannot be any different than the way they were. And, and, and by the way, I just want to say, because, you know, in terms of your focus on people with Asperger's syndrome, when I say uh, someone can grow and be different, if someone has Asperger's syndrome, I've, I've worked with adults and teenagers with Asperger's syndrome, and, and so have all of us at our center. And I'm, I feel really strongly that it really has to come from the person. I am not a person who's in favor of taking someone who's, say, 23 or 18 with Asperger's syndrome, who can have a conversation but has lots of challenges taking them and trying to make them be more neurotypical in a way that they don't want to be, that I'm completely against that. But when a, a child or adult or someone in their forties is open to connecting with us, and we often are, we're really good at connecting with people on the spectrum in a way that they feel really honored and respected. Then if they're open to that, then we are able to, if they want to, to really help them, to maybe overcome some challenges that may be holding them back in some ways that they would like some help with. And that includes especially the social areas like interacting with people and connecting with people, making friends, having conversations. But again, in a way, not in a way where we teach some person with Asperger syndrome the rules. Now listen, when someone gives you something, you say thank you. When you meet someone, ask them how their day was. We, we, are, we never get into that. We never do this rule-bound way of doing it. We teach a love of communication and we start to teach them to actually be interested in the other person. Because if, look, if you're interested in the other person, you don't need to be taught to ask someone how their day is because you're interested in them. So you're actually curious really how their day was and you might actually ask that because you want to know. So that's where we're coming from with this. And so... In this theory of neuroplasticity, which I believe in too, that all of our brains are wired differently, but they can all kind of rewire themselves how they want. And that I think you and I agree that we're not talking about making everybody wired the same way. That's not the goal. The goal is to enhance your wiring so that you, according to yourself and your desires, can lead a happy, healthy, safe, productive life. Yes, yes, for sure. Now, do you have a way at the uh, Autism Treatment Center of America with the Sunrise Program to measure outcomes? Actually, yes, we do. We have something called the Sunrise Program Social Developmental Model. And uh, it's really great. It's, here's what's amazing, right? There, there are. It's not the only developmental model in the world, Lord knows, right? What, what was we were we really excited about as we were originally creating it years back was it was this way to focus on yes measuring and tracking each child and adult exactly where they are as well as setting whatever the next goal is it's really key for that as well but it's a way of doing that that isn't about the way we track it it's not tracking their math skills it's not tracking their reading skills it's not tracking how compliant they are it's tracking these four main, what we call the fund, four fundamentals of socialization, which are eye contact and nonverbal communication, verbal communication, and then these two that get overlooked a lot, which is interactive attention span. Our kids have terrific attention spans for stuff they love. Interactive attention span is about how long they can stay engaged in something with another person. That's key. And then the last one, which also is hugely overlooked, flexibility. How flexible is a child or adult with 
cha a changing schedule or with going someone else's way when someone else wants to do a different activity. This is an area that a lot of our kids and adults struggle with for sure. Um, and so we track up according to five stages of development in each of those four areas. And we show parents and educators, but especially parents, how to track their own kids or adults along this same spectrum. So we help them with this, but they can also do this on an ongoing basis so they can see exactly where their child or adult is month to month and what the next step is that they could focus on. So I, I think this is important because I think what happens is, is with a lot of people on the spectrum, people decide in advance what they're not capable of, like we talked about before. But what we don't often see is because we've already made these subtle decisions about what they're not capable of, like they're not good at the social stuff. So then, you know what, let's help them with the stuff they can do, like academics and math and reading and doing all that. And look, nothing wrong with academics. I'm, I'm a fan of academics. But what ends up happening is we focus on that at the expense of the social stuff. So we help people, let, especially with Asperger's syndrome, actually, be terrific at all of that stuff, which they can do because we're working the part of their brain that already works great, right? But I'm a real big proponent, and we focus on this a lot in the Sunrise program, and this model tracks this, of working the weak muscle. Working the weak muscle, which for someone on the spectrum is not the math and reading muscle. It's not the memorization muscle. It's not the academic muscle. It's not the naming colors muscle. It's the making friends muscle. It's the social relational muscle. It's the engaging with other people or taking turns or being flexible, all of that. So we're not saying let's never do academics, but we always say let's, let's focus on social goals before academic goals so, so that we can help a child or adult on the spectrum to, to at least as far as they want to go, to be able to connect and relate to other people, which by the way, even if they want to be a mathematician, which is great, that social piece is still going to help them in a hundred thousand different ways. I love it. I love the way I love the way you think, Ron. Now, before we get to your book, The Autism Breakthrough, the groundbreaking method that has helped families all over the world, you just turned on in my brain the way my brain works, an analogy to what you just said about helping the things that need helping. And, you know, I'd, I was not going to go into the whole long story now, but I had 23 professional heavyweight boxing matches. I had a record of 13 wins, seven losses, and six draws. And my manager and trainer and mentor, Tommy Torino, used to say, look, for some reason, you have a great right hand. You could hit as hard as anybody in the world with your right hand. But... You got two left feet, your jab isn't that good, your defense is horrendous. We're going to work on those things. And the whole time I was with him from my first pro fight was when I was 38. My last one was when I was 52. We never spent a minute on my right hand. It worked on everything else all the time. So I could become a decent journeyman, 10-round main event pro heavyweight, not that I was going to be champion of the world. And I think too much what you and I see is the parent, the well-meaning, loving parent. If you ask, hey, how's your kid doing? Oh, he's getting all A's. Or he's getting A's in mathematics. Or he's, I didn't ask you about his academic record. I said, how is he or she doing? Okay. And you're right. In the same way as adults, a lot of way you you measure how you're doing in the race with monetary. When you're a kid, you measure it with your grades. Oh, that is so true. So true. I, I like, could not possibly agree with you more. And, and you're absolutely right. I, I, that boxing analogy is just terrific because no matter how good your right hand is, you're still going to get pummeled if you can't do the other stuff. And, uh, you know, if, if, if I have really weak leg muscles really, and I can't walk, you can make my arms really strong, and that's probably helpful, but I'm only going to walk if you work my leg muscles. So, so I totally agree with you. Now, you know, you recently came out with your book, The Autism Breakthrough, and why don't you tell us about that? Sure. Yeah, I, I, you know, I'm glad you bring that up. I worked on, you know, Autism Breakthrough was really like, it really, really was like a labor of love for me. You know, it wasn't like an academic, oh, I'm going to write a book. It was this thing of, you know, it, it has completely helped and transformed my life, but it's also helped 
so many kids and families that I really love and care about. Uh, it even helped my niece, by the way, who uh, was on the spectrum when she was a little girl. You might think that's genetically related, but she was actually adopted at three weeks old. So it was just complete coincidence. And my older sister, who's a senior teacher at the center, and her husband, who's also a senior teacher at the center, so they knew exactly what to do. They started a Sunrise program. I was actually one of the volunteers in that program. She just turned 20. You would never know anything. You would never guess her past. She's like the coolest, sweetest, awesomest person, outgoing, wonderful, caring, deeply caring. She's just super cool. And um, so this has helped a lot of people that I, I really love and care about. So I wrote this book for this reason. I wanted to sort of, you know, so many parents get sort of shuttled down one path when they get a diagnosis, whether it's autism, Asperger, whatever. Um, they get shuttled down this one path, oftentimes very behavior-based focus, and they don't get all their options given to them. And they, a lot of them are kind of, they're looking for a new way forward, something that's going to help their child in a new and better way. So I wrote this book so that anyone, it's not a book about my story. I talk about my story in the first chapter, but after that, it's a how-to book. It's actually a book about here's how you do each step. Here's how to do every little thing. And it walks them through each of the steps of doing at least the, the fundamentals of the Sunrise program. An educator or parent can implement this right at home or right in their school or classroom. Uh, it's very, uh, very hands-on. So it's, it's a lot like the way I talk. It's very conversational. It's got a little um, almost like a worksheet to do at the end of each chapter to help you implement it. It also, each chapter, each chapter has a corresponding web page that has video and other things to help you implement it. So it's a very interactive book experience. And I got to tell you, I, I wrote it. I thought there'd be some parents that love the Sunrise program that might buy it, but it's gone a lot bigger than that. And we've had people from Wayne Dyer to the president of the National Autism Association, the founder of the United States Autism and Asperger Association, that was the conference we were at, who've, who've not only read it, but written really extraordinary things about what the information in that book helped them do. So Autism Breakthrough is just for any parent that wants some actual techniques to help take their child in a new direction. What do you say to people who say, you know, Ron, you're giving parents false hope. What do you say to them? You know, uh, I, I do have people say that to me sometimes, actually. So I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. It's funny. First of all, let me just start by saying I'm always, I'm always a little befuddled by how many people in this world like to put those two words together, the words false and the words hope, because it's based on this idea that there are times, I guess, in some people's minds where hope can be bad or wrong or at least detrimental in some way. Um, hope is not a promise. Hope isn't saying, listen. If you do the steps in Autism Breakthrough or you take a Sunrise Program startup at the Autism Treatment Center of America, I promise your child will get here. It's not, a, it's not a promise. Of course, I would never make a promise because our whole philosophy is about not trying to predict the child's future years in advance. So I do think it's interesting, this idea that people are afraid of hope because here's all hope is. Hope is simply saying, I believe it's possible. I'm, I'm open to the possibility. So I'm going to, since I'm open to the possibility, I'm going to take action and do what it takes to help my child reach that possibility. Do I know for a fact exactly where my child will end up? Of course I don't. But here's what's interesting. The same people that end up criticizing and, and worrying supposedly about me promoting false hope are the same people that like to predict in advance all of the things these kids are not going to do. They feel totally comfortable saying to parents, I know your child's five, but he's never going to be able to do this. Uh, I know your daughter's 17, but she's never going to be able to do this or that. So all we're saying is let's, let's not decide in advance what our children are not going to be able to do. Let's give our children a chance. Then, then they'll go as far as they can go. So I always say I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not afraid of hope. I think hope, the only thing I've ever seen hope do is lead to action, and action is what our kids actually need. You just gave the same speech that I give down at the Hackey Reitman Boys and Girls Club in Broward County in Fort Lauderdale in the worst zip code in the world, 33311. And I tell the kids, look, my folks had a gas station in Jersey City. Everything I ever did, I was told, you really can't do that. You know, 
I wanted to become a doctor. I was writing to the AMA when I was 12 years old for my folks gas station. My high school advisor told me I wasn't smart enough to go to a six year medical program. I somehow got into it. I was told I was too small to be a heavyweight fighter when I won the Golden Gloves in first year medical school. And I tell these kids that everyone's going to tell you, you can't do it. And it's up to you to determine that because if you work hard and you get some breaks and you hear, well, listen, we got computers here, you got staff that cares about you here. And we have, we're so, I'm so proud of our kids because in the Boys and Girls Clubs of Broward County, where we serve about 12,000 kids, um, in the public school system, African-American males have a 36% high school graduation rate. At the Boys and Girls Club, we take the same demographic. We have a 90% high school graduation rate. Now, this has nothing to do with autism, neurodiversity rate. It has to do with the to me, one of the most important parts of today's whole wonderful, wonderful presentation by you is the positivity of hope. And I agree that it's an oxymoron to say false hope. If somebody wants to hope, hope, okay? And there's no guarantees with anything in life. Those are the rules God gave us. It's not the rules Ron Kaufman makes, you know. Um, how would someone get in touch with the Autism Treatment Center of America and learn about the Sunrise program? Okay, well, there's a few things I would recommend that they do. Number one, they can go to our website at www.autismtreatment.org. Okay, this is really autismtreatment.org. It's a great website. It has lots of resources. They can even watch free web seminars. Don't cost anything. They can uh, read testimonials. They can see interviews with not only with parents, but sometimes with their kids, which is just terrific. Uh, and they can also find out about all of our programs and how to set up a phone call with one of our Sunrise Program advisors. So I would go to that website, but also give us a call at 413-229-2100. If they call 413 if they call 413-229-2100, what they want to do is, is not just call, but actually ask for an appointment with the Sunrise Program Advisor. Um, this doesn't cost anything. Uh, we'll call you. We'll have an appointment. We'll call you. And we can really talk you through, see if this is a good fit for you. And we give out financial aid. We gave away over a million dollars last year alone. And if you're in financial challenge, let us help you. So you can ask that person about it. And, but the main thing you want to talk to them about is this possibility of something called the Sunrise Program Startup. Now, the startup course, it's called the Startup, is a one-week course, takes place on our campus. Uh, it's, it's actually about five days. And here's the cool thing. Because we have like a college campus with tons of buildings, we provide all food and all lodging for free. So we don't even charge for that. And people can come to our center. Uh, like I said, the, the normal, let's say, price if you get zero financial aid uh, is $2,200, including all food and lodging. You come to that program without your child, actually. That's an important thing to realize. You come to that program without your child. You learn all the techniques, and then you can go home or into your school and use it. We do have a program where you do take your child that has about a one-year waiting list, um, but you can put yourself on the waiting list for that, too. But the main thing is to think about uh, if you wanted to come to the Sunrise Program Startup. So uh, do that. The last thing I would just say, too, is uh, go to our Facebook page. I post on that page. We, are, we have a very, very active Facebook page, and they would look up Autism Treatment Center of America on Facebook and connect there. Okay, that's great. And what's the best way for uh, people to uh, buy your book, The uh, Autism Breakthrough? Okay, uh, several options. Number one, easiest option, just go on Amazon. Amazon will have it. Actually, it's doing really well on Amazon. So go on Amazon, type in Autism Breakthrough. It's going to be the first thing that pops right up. Uh, it is sold by Barnes and Noble. It's published by a major publisher. So uh, it's by St. Martin's Press. So it, you'll probably find it in bookstores. You can also order it directly from us if you want as well. I want you to keep up the good work, Ron. And thank you very much for being on our uh, program today. Thank you for having me, Hacky. I appreciate it. We've been talking with Ron Kaufman, the author of the book, Autism Breakthrough, the groundbreaking method that has helped families all over the world and the Autism Treatment Center of America and the Sunrise Program.